Okay. Um, a little bit, I don't know how much has been shared about uh, KID. Uh, I know that several of our team members have presented over the last two days. Um, just some high level numbers. We're six and a half years old now. Uh, we do about, uh, about 8 million monthly actives, uh, 650,000 daily actives, about 20 million page views a day, 30 to 40,000 items listed for sale. For those of you who are probably international and go, what the heck is KID? We are a, a C2C marketplace. Uh, we do not handle the transaction, so we are not e-commerce. Um, we are more like a classified, typical classified site. So that's what we do. And uh, 2017 numbers, we had 12 million items listed for sale, 1.8 million items confirmed, sold, worth 100 billion baht, uh, which is about 3 billion US. Top five categories for us are cars, motorcycles, properties, mobile, tablet. And number five for us is uh, uh, auto parts. And the most interesting one for those of you who don't live in Thailand, number six for us is Buddhist amulets. Yeah, so it's a massive trade. In fact, the most expensive Buddhist amulet ever confirmed sold on Kaidi was worth 25 billion baht. That's uh, $800,000 US. So it's a massive trade in Thailand. And it's quite unique to Thailand as well. Um, I think we're almost set up, yeah? Do we have a clicker? I can also click over. OK. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about creating a startup and what it means. So uh, this little image over here on the right is from Wikipedia, so you guys can look it up. But really, we talk about um, scale and market opportunities. But before I go into that, we go into the first set of slides. Uh, there's a book that um, is it uh, over here? Got to get us focused on it. Um, we talk about the entrepreneurial myth. Um, you know, startups is quite a new term. Term, if you can see, this is kind of the usage of. Uh, the word startup in books up until 2008, you can see it's something that really is just started talking about in the 1960s, 1970s, and really kind of coined in Silicon Valley with HP, actually, is HP that was kind of the first of these. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is the book that I'd recommend that everybody read um, if you're interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, and it talks about why most small businesses don't work. And if you look at an SME, SME is small businesses, 80% of all small businesses fail. In the startup world, 95% of all startups fail. And in fact, these whole pipe dreams that we have around, say, Zuckerberg or any of these guys, they're one in a million opportunities, one in a million creations. So if you look at Facebook, Facebook is the class of 2004 out of Silicon Valley. In 2004, there were plus or minus about 10,000 companies that were startups that year of that generation. Out of that, 90% of all value creation was from one company, and that's Facebook. The remaining 10% of value that was created from that 2004 class was the next nine companies. So that means there are 9,990 other startups that have no value left in them or very small, or they're non-existent any longer. So it's a highly risky endeavor. And in fact, go to the next slide, why is that? And what do we, what do we look at? Well, people think I want to start my own business, and they go, I'm a great mechanic. I'm a great mechanic, and why am I working for somebody else? Why in the world is my boss, he's taking all the value out of it, and I'm fixing all the cars. And so this guy, he goes off, and he thinks to himself, you know what? Next slide, please. This is what I'm going to build. I'm going to do it way better than my boss. It's going to look beautiful because I'm a good mechanic. Next slide. But what's the problem? When this guy actually does it, what does it actually look like? Next slide. Is this is what most of their garages look like. Why is that? Well, it turns out running a garage, running a, the, the garage itself, has nothing to do with being a great mechanic. You don't need to be a great mechanic. You need to know how to run a garage business. And you need to know how to hire great mechanics. That's the key. 
And so therefore, there's three areas that we focus on, and there's three personas that live in all of us. All of us have these three people living inside of us. We have the technician, which a large portion of this audience are, you guys are, uh, managers, and you have the leader. And the thing is, is that we all, every single one of us starts our career. We always start here. It doesn't matter what business you're in. I can be graduating with an MBA and I go to work for McKinsey. Guess what? My technician, I work with spreadsheets and PowerPoints. I come out of college as a, as a computer science major and I start out as a code jockey, just doing the most basic of coding for my company. Right? It doesn't matter. We all start our careers here. And then one day in our lives, we get really excited and we go, all right, I'm a good technician and I'm going to make manager. And I've made manager. What happens when we make manager? You get your business card and it has that little manager title. And what do you do? You don't know who to give it to, but you give it to all your friends. You know, hey, 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 friends, check that out. I'm manager, yo. I've made it. But the reality is there's this third persona, and that's the leader. So a technician lives in today, and it's all about their today world. I want to fix one problem, fix it one at a time, and I crave autonomy. Leave me the alone to get it done. And that's what a technician wants, freedom. The manager, they live in the past. Everybody says, what does that mean, lives in the past? The manager, actually, they are living in the past. They're looking at the assets that we have, the resources at hand, what happened in the past, and how do I optimize for solving the, solving the problem or whatever process I'm doing at the moment. So they actually are looking backwards and just trying to solve for today. What does that person crave? They want order. They want it to go according to plan. I put together the plan. Do not go off plan. That's scope creep. Don't. Why did it change? Let my plan be as it was intended. Don't change, right? And those are the product managers and project managers in this group of people sitting here. But the third person is the most important to build a startup and a business. And that person lives in the future, and that's the leader. They're not worried about the past. They're not worried about the technician. They're thinking about six months, 12 months, 18 months down the road. That's what I build for. And they will push and pull and drag the team to get there. And this is where it actually turns out, if you're going to build a startup, you need to be here. This is a temporary ordeal when you first start, because you're probably the programmer, the manager, and the leader, but it turns out you need to spend your time here on the leadership side. My own team, they say they, they don't like it when I get too much in my fingers involved in what they're up to. And I start to get my technician, the thing that I do when I start to be a technician, because you know what, it's hard to be a leader. It's fun to be a technician because it gets fixed now, and I can see the results of it. Being a leader, I, I don't see the results for ages, and I'm always looking forward. So what do I do? I spend my technician time looking at stats. I look at my analytics, and I go, hey, what's that? Hey, hey Mark, did you see this? Hey, Mark, how are we going to fix that? But actually, what Mark is saying, he goes, Tua, leave me alone. You need to tell me 12 months down the road. 18 months down the road, where are we going to be so I can build for that? And that's actually my job, is to be that way and the visionary behind it. And the reason I bring this up is because we get stuck into believing that this is what matters. And it turns out this does. This and cash flow, by the way. You need cash. <laughs> cash flow. So, next. So then, let's talk about What's an SME and what's a startup? What's really the difference, Tiwa? So if we look at the SME, you know, it's your bakery. And in Thailand, when you interview people, what do you want to do three or five years from now? Oh, I want to be, I want to own my own business. What kind of business? Oh, I want to own a bakery. I want to own a coffee shop. Okay, that's great. And it's going to be a startup. Ah, wait a second, there's a difference. And the reason we use a rocket ship is because startups are about being a rocket ship. It's about traveling to unknown places at massive speed. So let's take a look at some of the details of what the difference is. Next slide. So, and an SME, what's an SME really about? Next slide. Is we have a known customer, 
We have a known product and we have known profits. If you're doing an SME, you should have a plan to break even and have profit in six, year, six months to a year, depending upon how much infrastructure co costs you have. But you should have a very clear path on how you're going to make money. And that's going to be an SME. And you know what? It's a great business. Then what about a startup? Well, with a startup, it turns out we have an identified problem or opportunity. We have a proposed solution. It has to have a scalable market opportunity and potential profitability. You don't know if it's going to make profit. How many years was it before Google made their first cent? Does anybody know? Before they made their first dime, their first penny, five years. How long was it before Amazon made profit? Actually, for Amazon, it was 13 years before they were profitable. 13 years. So if you look at that, this is where it's scary. Startups is a very scary world, and you work your ass off, and you're not quite sure where it's going to lead to, and it's massively stressful to get there. So, but SMEs, are they important? Well, heck yeah. 2.7 million SMEs in Thailand, they're, they represent 99% of Thai enterprises, 78% of total employment, 90% of total exports, and 37% of the GDP. So people go, oh, I want to be a startup. Well, you know what? Being an SME is pretty good business as well. So I wouldn't look down on it. But being a startup, we're there to solve a problem. In fact, we'll get into what is it that investors are looking for, what I'm looking for. How many of you read this book? OK, good. If you're thinking of doing a startup, read this book, please. It's much talked about. It is uh, almost stereotyped now, but there's a reason because it teaches you a lot of important lessons about how to quickly figure out if your idea can be proven, if it actually has a product market fit. So this is why I recommend start with this book. Then, once you've started with your book, get out of the building. Go find out. Prove whether or not you have a product and market fit. And find the shortest and simplest way to do it. How do we do it? We actually use this whole methodology even in our marketing campaigns and our features that we launch. And it's basically going out there. We'll come up with an idea, print it on paper, and take it down to the market, the lot Lotfi, next to our office, and put it in front of the vendors. We go, hi, would you tell us what do you think? What do you understand? Can you use it? To try to understand, can we match it there? Because otherwise, we overthink our solutions. You know what the problem that KID has when we come up with our solutions is that we live in technology. We live with our devices every single day. We think about programming. We think about digital. But my customer doesn't. And so we end up with solutions that never match what the customer wants. And it's, it actually is heart-wrenching when you go talk to them. So we'll come up with a design, go show it to them, and they don't know how to use our product. And we're like, oh, God, it hurts because they don't care. They actually care about their lives. And they're saying, how are you going to fix it for my life? And we get it wrong all the time. So next one. So this goes back to the idea and pitching your story and what's important. And the things that are important to the investors should also be the things that are important to your business and you as a leader of thinking about your startup. So pitching your idea. Next slide. What is it that the investors are looking for? So first off, next slide, please, the team. The team is the first piece that we look at. So when I do investments, so I don't, I don't do many, but I'm an angel investor in about four companies so far. First thing I want to know is do I have a strong business leader and a strong tech leader? And they have to come together. They have to be a match. And those are the two primary foundations that I'm looking for because then I know we actually have somebody that's going to look out for the business side and somebody that's going to find the solution and can scale it to the opportunity. Next slide. And the next one is, what problem are you solving? And for the investor or anybody else who's listening to your business, assume that they don't know, so make it as simple and explicit as possible. So 
Okay, we believe buying and selling secondhand items helps your life. Reduce, reuse, recycle. And we want your grandmother or grandfather to use it. Reduce, reuse, recycle. We know exactly what problem we're trying to solve for. And that helps guide us as well in our leadership. Next one. What's your unique solution? Um, for those of you who don't know, this is the longest bridge in the world that connects Macau over to mainland China. It was built for over about $8 billion. It's a pretty unique solution. So what's your unique solution? So now you've identified the problem, and how are you going to provide a solution that's unique or better than the others out there? Next one. Can the idea scale? Is it something that can really grow? So for example, a lot of times you look at the businesses, they put, try to put technology to the solution, but it doesn't scale because it still requires high touch from a very large team. And it's going to be a very hard problem to scale. But what we're looking for is this something that you can actually solve for for a million people, 100 million people. Because when you're an SME, you know what? If I have 100 customers in a day, I'm pretty damn happy. Or 1,000 customers in a day. But when I'm a startup, 100 is nothing. What I'm looking for now is I get to... 100,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million, or then you get to the biggest of them, of a billion people that you're impacting. Uh, sorry. Who, who are, yeah, what is the size of the market? Is it a sizable market? Now, sometimes we get fooled into size of the market. For KID, you know what? I'm not interested in going global or regional. I'm just trying to solve a problem for 68 million people in Thailand. My goal is that 68 million people would sell one item. That's a big market. You don't have to have a giant market, but it has to have some size to it. And you know what? It could be that you're a B2B business that's solving for government. You're a security solution for governments, for people like CIA, so their shit doesn't leak. And you're only going to have 10 clients around the world. That's okay, but do you know how many people you're impacting? You're probably impacting something like 100 million people if you have those 10 countries with you. So look at the size of your market. Next slide. Who are your competitors? Know them. Understand them. Why are they competing? What makes you different than them? Tell the investors. Tell your team. You guys better know what's different between you and your competition that's out there in the market. I have competitors. Here's the other thing. If you don't have competitors, you're probably in the wrong market. So I welcome competitors. If I don't have them, that means, uh-oh, <laughs> why is nobody else interested in this? There must be somebody, right? It's got to be. Next one. Do you have traction? This is going to be important once you start pitching to investors. What's your traction? A lot of people come to me and they say, it's an idea. I go, I don't care about ideas. I want to know, have you gotten out there? Have you tested your product out there? Who have you talked to? Do you have any customers yet? Do you have traction behind the business? How many orders are you getting a day, a month? How are you going to get your next order? How are you getting traction behind the business so that it's growth? Next slide. And then, how do you make money? Uh, I was a little bit worried about this slide. Does anybody know who this is? Or do you have to be over 40 to understand it? <laughs> yeah, Jerry Maguire, yes. I was challenged. They're like, Tiwa, I'm not sure if everybody in the room is going to get that. They're not as old as you. <laughs> yeah. How do you make money? And you know what? You may come and say to us, I'm not sure yet. That's an okay answer. It is perfectly okay to not know yet, but you should have some guesses or ideas about how you can make money. And sometimes they can be obtuse ways that you wouldn't see it unless you understand the business. Everybody asks, how does Kaidi make money? Actually, what's interesting is I don't make money off the transaction. I make money off of value-added services for professional sellers. So I don't want the grandma or grandpa to pay me. But your first car, you don't have to pay me anything. But if you post a second car within a year, you're going to pay me 100 baht. Because if you're posting two cars for sale, guess what? You're probably not the average person. You're probably doing this for a living. And if you're going to successfully sell, give me a little bit. I don't ask for much. So sometimes you can find different ways and tangential ways to make money. Next. And then this is the most important one. 
Ideas are cheap. Execution is everything. Ideas, everybody goes, oh, I've got this unique idea. It's the, I'm the only person I go, ah, no, there's 7 billion people on the planet. If you think your idea is unique, I'm betting that's impossible. So what really matters is execution. If you come and approach me and talk to me about your idea, and then you tell me, oh, I'm under the radar. I can't tell you about my idea yet. I'm going to say, show you. The, here's the door. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Because the chances are I've probably heard your idea before considering I listen to no less than 50 or 100 pitches a year. So it's probably not unique. Execution is everything. Did you get out of the building? Did you get a, a, a POC built? Did you get it in front of customers? Do you have a customer? Did the customer try your product yet? How many of those people are out there that actually would potentially like your solution? So this is the famous uh, slide or a famous quote uh, from the Facebook movie. It says, a million dollars isn't cool. What's really cool, a billion is. But I actually have a different opinion of this, which is actually, yeah, it's not that. Here's what's cool, the next one, impacting a billion people. You impact a billion people, that's cool. In fact, if you talk to people like Steve Blank, you talk to um, uh, Shark Tank, what's his name, Cuban, Mark Cuban, and you talk about what you want in five years, you say, oh, I'd like to have $10 million in the bank. That's not being a startup. Actually, what you want to do is solve the problem, and hopefully there's a reward for you financially. Rev Mark, the money is an output. It's an output to what you do. The inputs is your business and whose problem you're solving. You get that one right, then the money will follow along. So money is a result, not the goal. People always ask, is it, oh, man, I want, to be 10 billion, I want $10 million. I want to be a billionaire. That's great. That's going to be a result of the startup that you did because you solved somebody's problem really well. You did it amazingly. So since we're at PyCon, um, I thought I should at least address the technology aspect of this. So to be honest, I don't care about the programming language. It doesn't matter. Next slide. Tech is the enabler for scale. That's what matters. And if Python's the right solution for it, great. If C++ is the right solution, if Java's the right solution, it doesn't matter. It could be Golang. It doesn't matter to me. What you got to get is the right, the right language, the right tech to solve for your problem. Because ultimately, as all of you know in this room, the tech's going to change in five years from now anyhow. And it's going to be something different. And we know we're going to have legacy code sitting on our platform. And we're going to have bugs that we know are there. So this is just a side note to the actual business. Because as I said, being the technician doesn't build a startup. Being a leader does. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the ecosystem today in Thailand. So uh, these are stats from TechSauce. So there's about 75 uh, funded startups in 2017. Um, you can see we've had some, quite a bit of growth. We've now up close to about 200 million US in funding, which is still quite small. What's interesting about the Thai market, especially for those of you who are visitors, um, in 2007, money started pouring into Vietnam for investment. Then in 2010, money started pouring into Indonesia, and that's the big story you hear, right? You get Gojek billion plus valuations. You got Grab with billion plus valuations. And here I was sitting in Thailand doing startups going, hello, did somebody forget Thailand? Um, finally, we're at a stage where it's finally coming to Thailand. The money is there. The hard part is where to put the money and finding the right teams to put it in. So it's still very early stage in terms of the ecosystem. Next slide. If you look at the ecosystem, you can find this in SlideShare. It's on TechSauce. So you can see who's kind of doing what. But the one that I wanted to point out is the venture cap piece of this, because money is the one that everybody always asks about. Next slide. Um, oh, sorry, I kind of went backwards here. I'll go to the next slide. Yeah. So there's, these are some of the active um, venture caps uh, companies in Thailand. Every single venture capitalist that comes to Thailand that I meet, they ask me one thing. Tiwa, what are some cool startups that I can put some money into, because I can't find any. Their biggest in the language of investors is called deal flow. 
deal flow is extremely hard to find in Thailand right now. And we see a lot of early, early stage startups. So these are like angel round, seed round. I'll get to that in just a second. And so they're looking for where, where can I put the money? And what they're looking for is that team that they can believe in, the business founder and the tech founder that is ready to take their money. Uh, go back one. One place to start is accelerators and incubators. These, how many of you guys are familiar with DTAC Accelerate, True and Cube, Spark, anyone? Okay, so let me talk about how these work. Uh, and they work slightly differently depending upon the company. But basically, um, Digital Ventures is SCB. Uh, Spark is part of the National Innovation Center and yeah, Agency, yeah, NISTA, DDA, NIA. Thank you, Hal. <laughs> NIA. Um, and so what they're trying to do is build the ecosystem from the bottom, from, from the, um, in the very, very early stages. Getting involved with any of these programs can be very helpful. Uh, the most mature of these programs, honestly, is probably DTAC Accelerate. And I don't say that because I'm biased because I spent so much time with it. But actually, they've got a very, very strong one. Uh, the companies, when you go in, you pitch. And if you get selected for the program, Different ones work different ways. Usually, they'll give you a bit of seed money just so that you can live, so that you have enough money to buy mama noodles because you don't know how to pay for your mama noodles because you're working on a startup and not getting paid. Uh, and then different ones of these will take different amounts of investment. Like, they'll take different stakes in the company for their investment. So, for example, like with digital ventures, they don't necessarily take a stake in all the companies that they participate in, neither with Gung Si Rise. DTAC will take anywhere between five to seven and a half percent for, and then they put the valuation behind that. Um, they can be very good for your startup. It puts you in with like-minded people. Uh, if you guys are interested in these programs, in August, they'll have the uh, DTAC Accelerate Pitch Day. You guys should attend it. Another place that you guys should attend if you're interested in this stuff is next week is TechSauce. There will be tons of startups running around pitching to VCs. There's going to be about 200 venture capitalists, VCs, and CVCs sitting in Thailand, in Bangkok, at Centara Grand Hotel next Friday and Saturday. They'll be in the room. If you guys have your idea, if you have your startup, and you want to get in front of people, be there for the conference. Um, and if you need introductions, you can just come track me down and say, Tiwa, I saw you at PyCon. I'd like for an introduction to something, somebody like this, this type of investor. OK, next one, next one. So, uh, you can't really see my pastel picture colors here, so sorry about that. Um, there's actually boxes in there and other things. Um, we hear a lot about the investments, and we talk about what, are, what type of investor should I have? What does it mean? Who are these people I hear? Angel, seed, series A, series B. What? I don't get it. I'm a programmer. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm a marketing person. I don't know what they're talking about. I'm not an uh, investment banker. So basically, what you're looking at is the amount of cash that they're going to invest and the maturity of the business itself. In this very early seed stage round, a lot of times it's friends, family, and your own bootstrapped cash that you've saved up. And you're usually at a concept or prototyping stage of your business. You're trying to find your product market fit. How much money is usually in that kind of seed stage? $1,000 to $100,000, typically. And then we move, once you start to get a bit of traction, you found your product market fit, you need more cash, you're burning, you're burning through your money. So then you go into angels and early stage investors. And once you go into that angel and early stage investors, what we're looking at is in these rounds, you're probably capturing a round of somewhere between 100,000 to 500,000 and maybe even up to a million dollars. Okay? This means I need some traction. I need some money. I need some firepower behind my business. I need to hire staff. I need to put into marketing. I need to have an office, all those types of things. Now, the business starts to get traction. I'm starting to get 100 customers, 1,000 customers. Then what happens? I have Series A investment. And this starts to change things. These investors are looking for, in Thailand, anywhere between $500,000 up but in reality, it's more like a million dollars to sometimes as big as 20, 30 million dollars. What changes here is the rights of the investors. So once we get to this stage, 
the investors say, okay, now you're asking for a lot of money. And guess what? I'm going to take advantage of that. And that means I have preferred rights. And the Series A investment, what it means for Series A is the rights that that investor has over the shares of the company versus you, the entrepreneur. And by the way, this is what Zuckerberg negotiated fabulously because he ended up with control of the company, which is a very rare thing to have happen. Because usually what the investors say is, wait a second, it's highly risky. That means if something happens and we have to liquidate the company, I get my money first. I have control, not you, the entrepreneur. And the rest goes Series B, Series C, Series D, mezzanine rounds, which is just pre-IPO stuff. These are the different rounds. There's a lot of information online about how to do term sheets, how to raise, how to do these things. I recommend if you're interested, go out and read it. There's a lot of good information out there um, that you can check with. And there's a lot of help in Thailand, particularly. You can go show up at DTAC, show up at Hubba, at the co-working spaces. There's a lot of people who have been through quite a bit of this that can give you advice on what it means. How do I write a term sheet? What does the term sheet mean? What is a term sheet? And how do I get to that place where I can find seed stage and angel, angel investors? Next slide. So that's a bit about uh, startups and startup investing. I hope it gives you guys a bit of a, an idea about the difference between being an SME and a startup. What are the things that people that are investing behind this, what they look for, because those things that they're looking for are the things that you have to answer in your business. And the key one is this, find your product market fit. So with that, I would take questions if you guys have any. Uh, in the back, uh, I can run a mic or, or if you can, are, are, can you talk really loud? Pardon me for just a second, my shoe has come untied, so I gotta tie my shoe. Well, funding-wise, uh, I see many companies go the ICO route. Uh, what do you think about ICOs? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, a lot of people have made a lot of money out of ICOs over the past couple years. In 2017, a lot of people got frauded in ICOs. Um, me, from this is... Let me give my very personal point of view. I think most ICOs on the market out there are Ponzi schemes and just trying to raise money on speculation and not real fundamental value. And so ultimately, first one in and last one, last, first one in makes all the money, last one in gets screwed um, in the, whoever, if they participate in the ICO. Now, I am actually looking for a case where an ICO actually will turn into long-term real uh, shareholder real value for a company or a business that isn't just making money out of speculation on the market. Um, I think there are use cases coming about. I just spoke to a friend last night, as a matter of fact, that's trying to work on this to use blockchain in areas where it will really help the world. So, for example, if you can put blockchain behind property titles in Thailand because property title and property ownership seems to get lost quite a bit. And we still have cases in places like um, Khao Yai, where it's unclear and people are frauding each other. So if you could take blockchain and put it up against that, you could probably do an ICO behind that because you need to create some value in the chain so that people that are going to mine it can extract some value out of it. But I think you do it not for the case of trying to raise money on the ICO. You do it for the case of trying to really make a difference in that technology. So I find ICOs a bit complicated, and to be honest, I'm not near an expert on it, and there are some people that are, and that have made a lot, my friends have made a lot of money on it. They've asked me, why don't I ICO KaiD? And I said, because I just think it seems like a Ponzi scheme to me, and I, would, I don't think it adds real value to my customer. Um, so I would feel guilty, but it is in path, and there are a lot of people that are very smart that know how to do that for a company as well. Does that kind of answer your question? with my opinion behind it as well. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, sir. This is that you're excited about building and people are building in Thailand and in the region, I guess. What do you think is the stuff, I guess, 
you said we need to build a solution. So what are the opportunities and the problems we should be thinking about? Yeah, and if I had an awesome uh, answer for you, I'd probably be doing it and not talking about it here. So and making yeah, a lot I want of money the secret out of it. sauce, man. What's the secret <laughs> sauce? Uh, so things that I'm personally excited about. I think there's a lot of local uh, local problems that still need to be solved for, and particularly areas that I'm interested in. For me, is B two B solutions. If anybody comes talk to me about B two C marketplace and e commerce again. Uh, just, I'm not interested in what you have to talk about. But if you come up with B2B solutions, I'm very keen to hear what you have because doing business in Thailand is still not easy. And so there's a lot of pain points that entrepreneurs and SMEs have that I think tech companies can solve for. Another one area that I'm particularly keen on and that has to do with more about the region is around agritech. And the reason is in Thailand, we have 40 million um, working adults in Thailand. 32% of which are still in agriculture. That's 12 million people, and that 12 million people are the lowest income earners in the country. That's just Thailand. That's not even talking about Indonesia or Philippines, or actually everywhere except for Singapore, because they don't have any land to actually farm on. <laughs> they have rooftops. Um, and if you, if you compare that to, say, the United States or North America, I mean, in... in U.S., only 1.5% of the working population is still in agriculture. Uh, Western Europe, you're looking at anywhere between 1% to 3%. So that's where I think opportunities in this part of the world is still massive. Payments is another one, and it's a really interesting topic around payments because um, if you try to take like an M-Pesa out of Kenya and try to apply it to Thailand, it's not, gonna, it's, it's not necessary for here. But we do have other payment problems in Thailand. However, if you look at, let's say, Bangladesh, um, then maybe some of those m pay types of solutions would work very well. Payments is a space that's continuing to progress in this country, but there's still a lot of pay points behind it. And the reason is, is for example, people don't have credit cards. There's an estimated 22 million credit cards in Thailand, uh, and the estimation is there's between four and five million card holders. Uh, whereas there are 40 million uh, debit cards in the market, and we are quite banked in Thailand, so you have to find other types of solutions for it. So those are the things that are interesting me at the moment. Um, there's also another one. There's a, there is a startup I'll tell you about that I'm interested in. It's called NRES, and what they're doing is very simply IoT devices to try to help buildings save energy, and I'm quite excited about it. And it's like people go, but this is so basic, and people have been doing this for years in Europe. I go, yes, they've been doing it in Europe. This is a company that's trying to do it in Thailand, right? And so I think there's opportunities in that space as well. Great. Uh, yes, I had. Also, one quick question. Um, so let's say you're um, super technical, super geeky. You've got this awesome idea. You've, you can know how to build and everything. How do you go about finding a business co-founder? Um, <laughs> actually, you know, what's funny is it's usually always the opposite problem. Every business, every business founder goes, how do I find a CTO or a tech founder? Um, so I think finding the business founder is actually quite easy. Uh, the, I would either A, go to networking events or go show up at Hubba and other places where you can find people, like-minded people. Um, you know, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a whole host of people that are in business that would love to be able to work with a strong tech founder and get into the startup space. Um, for me, I, I would show up at networking events and find people or people in your network and people that you trust. Uh, ultimately, trust is the big one because if you're going to go partner, it turns out business is like marriage, so it's, it's hard work. <laughs> it's worse than, <laughs> it's worse than marriage, yeah. Uh, yes, they are. it's marriage without the sex, yo. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I don't, I haven't found that, I've, I've rarely ever found a case where the tech founder can't find a business founder. Finding a business founder that you like and that you really trust can really help you lead, that's the one I'd be extremely selective of. Yes, sir. Um, I'm asking a question for, for those who don't really want to have a startup or do a startup, but really have some unique idea that they, they think would be 
something that make a difference. You know, like along the line of what you said, uh, make impact for a lot of people, but uh, not necessarily interested in, in, in making a go at itself. What's your what's your take? Is there a mechanism for, I guess, social enterprise type funding scene in Thailand? Is that is, is that a mechanism for making things happen, but not really driven by, by, you know, coming up with your own startup brand? Um, so, uh, I'm by no means an expert on the social enterprise space in Thailand. There's a few of them that are in the market that I know of. There's some platforms out there around crowdfunding and other things that I think uh, social enterprises like that. And if you're looking for money to get it, you know, seed money to get the idea started and be able to fund it, I think crowdsourcing is actually crowdfunding is a great place to start with. The other place I would look at is CVCs. Uh, so CVC stands for Corporate Venture Capital. Um, Thailand's a weird market where this corporate venture cap happens to be one of the big initiators and help uh, ecosystem builders for Thailand at this early stage. Usually you wouldn't see this in other markets. It just happens to be that DTAC, AIS, and True are three big carriers, got behind it. You've got all the big banks behind it. So I think SCG, Adventures, um, D DV, Digital Ventures, they, I think there are parts of their uh, parts of their investment thesis that would support those types of um, opportunities. Probably have time for one more. Two. Yeah, Thanks. Oh, you're talking about like B, right? Business. You talk about C. What about like G? Government, like GovTech. Any idea on that? Or you think like maybe like it's I don't know. Private sector shouldn't replace that. I don't know. But. Um. Actually, it's funny that you mentioned that. It's an area of passion uh, where I speak a lot and have a lot of discussions with the government, governmental sector. It's a big opportunity. Um, the good news is the Thai government's actually starting to do some stuff, so it's nice to see some activity. Um, I think for me as an investor, I wouldn't go into government tech unless I really knew that the founder had, re had the right last name. <laughs> this is Thailand. So it's the reality of our world. Um, I hope I don't have any, there's no journalists in the room <laughs> quote me on that. Please don't quote me on that. I don't want to get in trouble with the government. Please, cop. <laughs> yeah. So guys, um, I think that's it for timing. I'm, I'll be around here for a bit. So if you guys have more questions or things that you'd like to pass by me, I'm open here myself, my team's around as well. And uh, I appreciate uh, having me today. It's been good fun. Thank you, Cap. Cop and Cap.